Is it permissible to give da'wah to the opposite gender? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Difficult not to smile about this because this is that controversial one. The brothers giving dawah to the sisters them. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And it's very rare the other way around, but we need to deal with that as well. Sisters, misakini, and being hooked up and having to give dawah to males. Rarely. Maybe male colleagues at work and so on. I think that's the most common that I come across. But really it's about those brothers, those brothers on the dawah tables, those brothers who go out at the, in the night times and go to the popular kind of areas where there's a lot of footfall in the markets and sometimes to the club scene where they're seeing people all over the show and they come across a nice looking sister and you know, hey, I've got to give dawah, everything goes. Does everything go? Well, let's look at this first of all. Let's look at the ruling without the jokes and anything like that. It's actually permissible for, what are the guidelines and for interaction between males and females? First of all, you need to know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's rahmatun lil alameen, a mercy to all of the worlds and everything which is within. So we're talking animate, inanimate, living, non-living, animal, human being, human beings and jinn. So of course, men and women and young and old come under that. So it is permissible, of course, to give da'wah in the general sense to women. Likewise, is it permissible to speak to them specifically in matters? Again, we have so many evidences of that happening. We don't have of any single evidence where the Prophet Sallallahu refused to speak to women because of the fear of fitna. At the same time, we're not going to try and make out that there's not an issue there. Of course there is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even addresses the mothers of the believers, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu and said to them, do not be soft in speech, lest those people who have got some sickness in their hearts, yani they've got that, yani, you know, the desires are out of control, they start feeling, yani, oh, you know, this is a come on. That's what happens, isn't it? Especially males, when they feel that, you know, the woman is being, you know, very polite and very nice, they always see it as, oh, I think I've, yeah, I've scored there, I'm in. And, you know, that's the, 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 the mess that the male race finds itself in 24 7 and so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, and the, the, uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi is being addressed but it's his wives who are being addressed specifically that be careful of your speech don't make it so alluring or soft and so on and those are the wives of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who are the most religious and the best of all people the best of all women so what then about us meaning the human race that came after the Prophet Sallallahu and us in terms of the women, and then of course then the brothers as well. We have to be super extra careful. We know, for example, that the Prophet Sallallahu has completely forbidden al-khalwa, seclusion. So it's not permissible for a man and a woman to be alone in a particular area. The Prophet Sallallahu said that when they are, then the third person is shaitan, meaning there's never going to be any khair that comes from that. It's always going to be a fitness situation. So it's obvious that those those kind of uh, conversations will start to drift and they easily, easily drift off the serious and the, the intended topic. That could be a route for fitna. It could cause some kind of problem. And I want you to understand that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't just prohibit zina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't actually prohibit the final kind of product of adultery. That's why he says, don't la taqrabu zina. Aqrb, yani, don't even get close to zina, means everything which leads to it. So it's the dressing up, it's the perfuming of oneself, it's the intention to go out in that manner, it's the, 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 the language and the flirtation that occurs before it, and so on and so forth. So all of that is prohibited. Not just the final consequence, which of course is the most serious and the, the, the one that we want to try and avoid. And so, even though we know that it is permissible for interaction to occur. So, for example, a man and woman, they can speak openly to one another and they should keep it upon serious topics. Those topics which can't be twisted or those topics which will not allow a person to start to increase in their desires for the other person. In a public area, not a private secluded one, we've already said that. And a public area means that it's open or that there are other people. So it's always good to have other people around. Then this is permissible. So actually a Dao, a table, is about as great a place for it to occur because it's in the middle of lots and lots of people. People are seeing you. You've got your your colleague there as well so you can't you know some people might just be walking past and ignoring what you're saying but your friend is there your colleagues are there the people who are there to keep you on the short on the on the you know the straight and narrow and making sure that you don't mess about then that's actually a really positive place to give that openly
But I do want to say that in principle, we should be focusing on our own people. So men to men, women to women. Not only is there a greater kind of uh, appreciation and understanding of each other's needs and our mindsets and so on, but it's much safer, much more safer. Any person, any man, let me tell you, especially the sisters out there, any man who says to you that they don't, you know, that they're sweet and innocent and they see you as a sister, that's a lot of nonsense. No man sees another woman as a sister. That's a lot of rubbish. Okay, this idea that we're just friends. There's no such thing as just friends. Everyone has seen that's a load of nonsense. And it's just basically the first part of a, a relationship starting to develop. Love starting to get into the, into the hearts. And disaster basically following. An absolute catastrophe waiting to happen. So, what I'm saying is that if we can avoid having to be in this scenario where the risk is increased. I'm not saying that every man is shaitan and every woman is some alluring temptress. But I'm just saying that we should avoid the fitna. We can, we can we prevent these scenarios by ha- having our sisters focus on the, on the dawah table. Or in another environment, sisters focusing upon the women and the brothers focusing upon the men. That's better. But of course, we know that there are some circumstances that can't happen. So if there's only brothers on a dawah table and a sister walks past, a non-Muslim woman stop, walks past and she stops and she asks a question, then we're going to say, right, I'm not speaking to you, love, because you know, you're know you a fitna for me. That's obviously not going to happen. You're going to carry on with the conversation. You're going to make sure you keep it professional, keep it polite, and be aware that, remember, she's not a Muslim. She doesn't understand this idea of, you know, you just, this is not the time that you become the greatest mutaqi in the world where you start looking down at your feet, you know, because you're so holy. You don't want to look at her at all, you know. She's going to look at you thinking, you're, you're weird, aren't you, bruv? Yeah? So... We have to understand that there are some societal issues as well. There's a culture that we are giving the da'wah in. Just keep it real. You know what's not You know what's not allowed. You're not allowed to change this conversation. You're not allowed to flirt. And I really want to focus here with the brothers because they're very successful in the da'wah. They're out there on the public front. They're in the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the firing line. And they know that they are very powerful with their flirtatious behavior. Women are very, very much attracted, attracted to it. It's something which is real. Every man knows it and every woman knows it. They just don't want to talk about it. They just want to leave me muggins I need to, to take the hit for it on a video like this which is not a problem because I'm taking hits there and night for the brothers and the sisters in the da'wah I have no problem I just wanted to make it clear that let's not ignore these realities we do have very clear Islamic guidelines that tell us what is absolutely haram as long as we avoid this it is permissible and uh, it is permissible for men to speak to women and for women to speak to men and I, but I just want to add some of those home truths I want you to I want you to know that the brothers out there who are listening to me you know that your heart is very easily turned I'm a man, you're a man, and we are affected by women very, very easily. And it's very, 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 very easy to fall into flirtatious behavior. And you have to try and avoid that. And you must keep that, yani, that professionalism and that taqwa around you. And that's why it's very useful to have colleagues with you close at all times who fear Allah. And they're going to give you advice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they tell you, bruv, that was a bit yani, loose. That, and you don't take that in an insulting way. And you should be ashamed of that if you fell into it. And say, oh, I'm not going to do that again. That's something which is real. As for the sisters, I want to say that you need to be that bit more careful because you are, whatever people say, are easily tempted. That's something which can happen. Men play women all the time. They know exactly the right things to say, the way to look, the right little laugh, the way to make you laugh and so on. They know everything. They are playing you all the time. And I'm telling you that this is something which you must be aware of. And the the situation can be a lot worse if this is a non-Muslim. And they're looking, they see a pretty sister, for example, and they say, well, you know what, uh, this, this is great, I'll go and have a chat with this girl. And, you know, sometimes they're not even interested in the da'wah. You don't know that. And they can come across as super sincere. Believe me, we can, we can put on a blag if we need to. Yeah, I'm really interested in this Islam, whatever. The only thing is I'm interested in you. That's it. They're not just saying it. So you need to be aware of this. And this is the threat that you've you got to be careful about. And for the women, you find them less on the da'wah tables, but it's mostly those that they work with. Uh, their male colleagues or neighbors and so on and so forth. And um, I just want to say that it's good to initiate things off with general kind of discussions and so on, but keep uh, a distance. And by a distance, I mean keep a topical distance, meaning what you speak about, of course, a physical distance. And I and this is something very important. You know, when the non-Muslim becomes very close to the moment of Shahada, and especially at the moment of Shahada, We are talking incredible emotions which are genuinely out of control. So now at this moment, I want to now talk about genuineness, okay? We're not talking about the false blagging of the people. Now we're talking real emotion. At this moment, people just want to go and hug someone. 
People want to cry. They've just become Muslim. They've changed their lives. Their lives are never going to be the same again. And that's why you'll often see, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking on both parties. I'm talking about the guy who just became Muslim or the sister who just became Muslim. And I'm talking about the one who just gave the shahada. Especially if you've not been given many, you see this yani that you've just helped someone potentially save themselves from the hellfire. You're completely overtaken by it. And you know, people, that's why you hear Allahu Akbar, which is like the most politically incorrect thing to say in our current time. Every time someone becomes Muslim, Allahu Akbar, everyone's running running for cover, what's happened now? So you gotta understand, it's such an expression of joy. People are so happy. That's why you see people get hugged to death. Everyone, even the uncles get up. And you know uncles don't get excited for anything. And so when the uncles want to get up and you know and 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 hug Jack Jones, whatever his name is, this new Muslim, then you know that people are excited. So there's excitement on this side, there's excitement, and there's nothing more awkward than giving da'wah to a sister and she she's taken a shadow la ilaha or shadow na Muhammad Rasulullah and she bursts into tears and all she wants is a big hug and it's just you and her. What happens then? You know what I'm saying? So it's awkwardness, you know, and how many times even in public kind of gatherings and conferences when you give da'wah and I've given da'wah to a, to a, a doing the shahada rather with the, with the, with the Muslim sister, with the, with, the, with the sister who's about to accept the shahada and you're like, you know, need to just step back here and at this last moment because she's gonna, and that's what they do, they just go for a hug, they just want a hug and just cry out. There's absolute innocence, absolute purity, there's nothing untowards. But you know that that one hug, yani, is the establishment of um, God knows what that's going to come next. And that's why often in that scenario, when it comes to the shahada moment, I like to leave it to the sisters. The brothers for the brothers, sisters for the sisters. Or if they want to do it in an authoritative way, they don't know they need a sheikh to be able to go through the process, then you know what? Step back and let the sisters be right there. And that's how I do it. I have the sisters on point, on cue, soon as shahada in, in there, love a dove, huggy wuggy, and it's all great. That's the way to absolutely get around this problem. I know that there's a lot, lot of issues in there which are funny, but this is a serious matter. Uh, in, at the end of the day, in essence, it is permissible to have interaction between brothers and sisters in order to get the da'wah done. But be very careful. Remember one thing, okay? That, you know, there's this kind of phrase out there. I know that well, this is about da'wah and so on. But there's people who believe that da'wah comes at any cost. That it's so important that it doesn't matter what happens. There's never been a greater falsehood ever in our history than this phrase. Dawah is not at any cost. Dawah is not at your personal cost. If you wreck yourself, if you fall foul, it doesn't matter how many million people are saved. I don't care about how many people become Muslim, if I'm going to end up in the hellfire, if I'm going to start falling into haram, if my desires are going to start to get incited so easily that I can be turned on by every single person that I speak to and I'm a mess and my family falls apart and everything. It's not worth it. Dawah is not that important that you fall foul as well. And just like when you're in a plane and they tell you to put the oxygen mask on first before you give it to the child, well, you know what? The same with the dawah. Put the dawah yani, to yourself first before you start giving down to other people make sure you protect yourself in this game because it's very very important that you remain strong before you start giving that guidance and hope to other people and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh